Urinary incontinence, or the loss of bladder control, affects about 78 million women in America. Although it is a very common problem, it is not considered medically normal. And that means it isn't something that we as women should just have to live with. Today, understanding the symptoms of female incontinence and an innovative approach to managing your pelvic health. I'm Erica Vitrini. Access Health starts now. For some of us, it happens when we sneeze or laugh. For others, it can keep them up at night. And then there are those who can't quite make it to the restroom in time. We're talking about urinary incontinence, and up to 60% of women will have UI at some time in our lives. My first guest today is a board-certified gynecologist with Gaia Wellness, Dr. Shweta Patel. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Erica. Okay, so let's get right in. What exactly is urinary incontinence, and what causes it? So urinary incontinence is involuntary loss of urinary control. In other words, when you're not trying to pee and you pee, and it usually has to do with weakened pelvic muscles. Um, this can happen because of several things and at any phase in a woman's life, but usually it's a result of childbearing, pregnancy-related trauma. Um, it can also happen due to aging. It can happen due to hormonal changes in a woman's life, such as in menopause. And it can also happen due to other health conditions that can affect a woman's neurological system. Weakened pelvic floor muscles. Unfortunately, not all of us know our anatomy as well as we should. What are our pelvic floor muscles? So our pelvic floor is um, a converge of three very large pelvic floor muscles. Um, if you were to think of our pelvis as like a house, um, which houses our uterus and our bladder, which is on, in the front of our uterus, and all the other structures like our ovaries and our fallopian tubes, but they're all nicely and securely put in to our pelvis with the foundation being made out of our pelvic floor muscles. Um, so having strong pelvic floor muscles is comparable to having a strong foundation in your house. So doctor, as we mentioned at the top of the show, urinary incontinence is a very common women's health condition, but it's not something that we have to learn to live with, correct? It is a very common condition, and I think, unfortunately, it's become common and um, normalized in that women have just started to see it as something we we deal with. We see our, you know, our mothers, our grandmothers living with it, and it's not something we feel is abnormal, per se. Um, and even though it is absolutely treatable, we just don't bring it up, and as a result, it's common but not very much known about. So, Doctor, right after giving birth to my daughter, I did indeed experience UI, and I know how it impacted my life. From what you've seen, how can it impact women's lives? It has far-reaching effects on a woman's life in terms of just in general, it's not a life-threatening condition, but urinary incontinence can be a very quality of life compromising condition. You know, women can be affected emotionally in that how they're going to interact with their friends, what social events, what activities physically, what exercises they feel comfortable doing, all of that can be impacted by having urinary incontinence. Doctor, we have so much more to talk about, but first we're gonna take a little break and hear from Kim Mears about her experience with UI. Take a look. Well, my name is Kim. I'm 66 years old. I'm retired. As far as hobbies, I do yoga five days a week. I swim daily. Um, I love to read, and I have two dogs. They're both Australian Shepherds, Red and Ruby. They love the park, and we enjoy our time together. Probably in my late 50s, early 60s, I started to notice a bit of a problem with bladder leakage. Even with a maxi pad, it was still leaking through sometimes to my clothing. I was having to do laundry and panties and everything on a daily basis, and I knew, you know, at that point, I had to do something. My dogs even noticed the difference. We used to go to the dog park for at least an hour each day, and they looked forward to that. And I had to start shortening the trips because there were no restrooms at the dog park. I remember one particular situation. My granddaughter and I were on a car trip together, and we needed to make a pit stop, and there was only one stall available. Now, me being the grandmother, I obviously felt like I should let my young granddaughter go first. That wasn't going to happen. I had to explain to her that Mimi has to go first. And I realized in that moment that 
I had really lost control of the situation and that I needed to find a solution to this problem. Urinary incontinence affects more women than men and is one of the most underdiagnosed and undertreated conditions in women's health today. Dr. Patel, why is that? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with how comfortable women feel about addressing or even bringing it up with their doctors. Um, I think 25% of women who actually have urinary incontinence do something about it, which is such a low number when you think about it. And the average amount of time it takes for a woman to even address her concerns is about six and a half years from when she first starts experiencing these symptoms. I know, it's very unfortunate. And I think a lot of it has to do not just with with how it has become normalized, but also I think we as physicians aren't doing necessarily our best in terms of addressing it or bringing it up and making it a conversation that's easy to have. And then on top of that, it's embarrassing for women to bring this up. Some women um, think that it might not even be something they can have fixed or know about the various options that they can actually consider. Um, some might think that the treatments are a little bit more complicated than they are. And so I think a combination of all of that brings into play why it's underdiagnosed. And I will say too, if, it, if it's happening right after childbirth, your focus is not on yourself. True. And often on this child you just right. gave birth right. to. Motherhood. <laughs> exactly, motherhood and all that it is. Um, but it's important for the doctors to bring it up. I think that's Absolutely. true. Absolutely. So we hear urinary incontinence talked about in, in a lot of different ways. We hear leaky bladder, overactive bladder. What's the difference? So I think the best way to distinguish the two would be a leaky bladder is where you're actually losing control over urine, um, as opposed to an overactive bladder where you're feeling the urge to go frequently. Um, and we can further divide a leaky bladder into stress urinary incontinence and urge urinary incontinence. And stress urinary incontinence is where you are leaking because of increased physical stress that your bladder is not able to compensate for. Um, think of sneezing, laughing, coughing, jumping, um, physical exertion. Um, in the pandemic with a lot of patients having COVID and coughing a lot, um, we've seen a lot of an increase in that as well. Um, Urge incontinence would be more of the commercial that you see when you're like, gotta go, gotta go. Um, when you feel the urge to urinate, but you can't actually make it in time before leaking to the bathroom. All of those can actually come together into a picture that we call um, mixed urinary incontinence. So doctor, are there particular risk factors? Absolutely. Um, so outside of being a woman, <laughs> um, it's funny how men don't have to deal with this as much, I would say, but um, being a woman, um, childbearing and uh, trauma related with childbearing, even pregnancy itself and the stretching of your pelvic muscles related to the growing child inside can add to that. But then having a long traumatic birthing experience can also compromise your pelvic floor. Um, age, as we mentioned, um, and um, menopause, hormonal changes that can, uh, again, affect the overall integrity of our muscles. Um, and then, of course, there are other risk factors like neurological conditions that can compromise how our brain communicates with our bladder and our muscles. So interesting. And so ultimately, how is a woman diagnosed and, and what doctor should she see? So really, as physicians or healthcare providers, anyone can be the first line in detecting um, this concern in a woman by simply just asking the question. Um, I think that women are still becoming more comfortable with bringing topics like this up. And so being the, the initiator of the conversation can definitely be very helpful, whether you're a family medicine practitioner or a gynecologist. In fact, you don't even have to go to the office for it, even a telehealth consult currently with the pandemic, sometimes access to care can be difficult, but you can still have this um, diagnosed just by speaking with a physician and not having a physical exam. And at that point, I think just from a physician's perspective or a generalist doctor's perspective, um, if a woman is complaining of having these concerns, referring her to a urogynecologist would probably be my next step um, so as to make sure that she gets the appropriate care that she needs. I mean, this is such good information. I think just having the knowledge to know that it's not something we have to live with is so important. Correct. Doctor, thank you so much for being here today. When we come back, we'll take a look at an innovative new technology first approach to treating urinary incontinence. I was completely soaked. I was like, okay, something's obviously happening. Like I'm, I'm leaking, but I didn't 
immediately want to call the doctor because I had heard that this is what happens to a lot of women. There was shame that I didn't have control over my body. I didn't know when it was going to happen. It could happen at any time. And it kind of kept me from doing everyday things. And I always had to have a pad on. Leakage was actually, it was robbing me of moments. And then my mom told me that it's happened to almost all of my aunts. And everyone just kept telling me, you know, this is common, this is common, this is normal, this is what happens. And then I finally realized just because it's common doesn't mean that it's normal. My next guest has spent over 20 years as a practicing OBGYN. She is a board-certified urogynecologist with a clinical focus on urinary incontinence. Welcome, Dr. Pulliam. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Happy to be here. So let's talk about the options for treatment when it comes to UI. So urinary incontinence, um, there are lots of different treatments, and they range from uh, very simple things in some cases, uh, and also much more complicated things. And really, the basic idea is that you start with the simple and move on to the more complicated and more risky if you need them. Mm -hmm. So things that would be in the more complicated or more risky category include things like medications, um, which have side effects, or surgery, which has potential complications. And both of those things work, um, but it's better to do the less risky things first, and that is usually behavioral therapies. Behavioral therapy. So these are things that we can take on ourselves. And, and can you describe a few of those? Sure. Um, there are a lot of them. Um, some of them in, involve um, modifications of your, of your diet or fluid intake, such as cutting down on caffeine or alcohol or making sure you drink an appropriate amount of water a day, not too much and not too little. Um, another one is weight loss. Um, and a third one might be bladder training, um, where you help your bladder get used to voiding less and less frequently over time. Uh, and then a final would be pelvic floor muscle exercises. You're referring to Kegels. I am. Yes. Yeah. We, I think we've all heard of Kegels. I don't think that um, enough of us actually practice them or maybe don't really understand how important they are in the long term. Um, can you talk to that a bit? Kegels in some ways are a big mystery. And in fact, I think a lot of women know they ought to be doing them, but they don't. In fact, only about a quarter of women who should be doing them because of a pelvic floor problem like urinary incontinence actually do them. And of that group, only about a quarter of them do it effectively enough to achieve the results they're looking for, for example, treatment of urinary incontinence. So when we're talking about doing them effectively, it, it, the point is for us to just create strength That's on that right. pelvic floor. Right, strength and endurance. So the pelvic floor, um, as we discussed previously, are a, sort of a basket of muscles inside the bony part of the pelvis. And when you contract them, they should lift and also move all of the organs in the pelvis. And we're talking about the bladder here towards the pubic bone or towards the front of the body. And so strengthening those muscles allows them to do that more effectively and efficiently and with greater strength. Such good information. I wish that I had this information when I was having children. We have to take a quick break. Dr. Pulliam, you're gonna stay with us. And when we come back, we're gonna discuss an at-home system that in just a few minutes a day can help you get closer to living without leaks. Welcome back. According to the American Academy of Family Physicians, conservative therapies are recommended as a first-line treatment for UI. This includes pelvic floor muscle exercises. And joining me now are Kim Mears, Anna Gannon, and of course, Dr. Pulliam, thank you so much for sticking around. Um, Anna, Kim, we heard earlier about your challenges with UI, but, but tell us a little bit more about your experiences and your diagnosis. Anna? Sure, yeah. Um, mine started right after I had my second child. Um, I went through postpartum and I was having minor leaks as that occurred, but about three weeks postpartum, uh, I decided to throw a party so everyone could meet my baby, uh, which seemed like a good idea, but then wasn't. And during that time, I had a major leak. And when that happened, it was just full stop. I was really concerned because I'm a yoga instructor, as you know, um, and I run for my mental health. And I just knew that if this was going to be an issue, I needed to get it taken care of right away. So I called the doctor the next morning. I wasn't going to wait. I love it. You took action. And Kim, how about you? Well, I actually began experiencing issues 10 years ago. It was minor leakage. And in talking with friends and even other family members, I realized that just seemed to be part of getting older. So I tried to band-aid the problem together by wearing, you know, panty liners. But as time progressed, um, it kept getting heavier. It kept interrupting with my 
daily life. I mean, you know, when you walk into a store, the first thing I did was I sought out where's the nearest restroom, um, had to cut short um, a, a lot of visits, um, go to lunch with, you know, a group of friends. After maybe the second or third, you know, I'm sorry, I need to make a quick pit stop, you just kind of start to retreat mm -hmm. and you just find yourself kind of isolating, actually. And I knew that I needed to do something to gain control back. And Dr. Pulliam, I understand that you've brought a system with you today that can help strengthen pelvic floor muscles and can reduce the symptoms of UI. That's right. I have the Leva Pelvic Health System. Um, this is a wand. Uh, here. And, uh, it's a small wand. I think. So the wand is placed in the vagina and it's used actually for two and a half minutes twice a day. Um, you can see what happens when you lift uh, the pelvic floor muscles and you lift and hold. The app and the wand are then used in conjunction with what we call the Leva Women's Center. Uh, this is a group of dedicated coaches uh, that will uh, work uh, with women all the way through uh, their treatment for about 12 weeks um, as they began to see improvement. Many women see improvement as early as four weeks, but the program goes for 12 weeks uh, so that we can ensure that everyone gets the maximum uh, improvement uh, out of the experience. Um, so I have to ask the question, I think I know the answer, does it work? So it does, um, and actually uh, we've just completed uh, a randomized controlled trial, a clinical research study, uh, looking at uh, use of the Leva uh, as compared to doing pelvic floor muscle uh, exercises at home on your own. Um, and what we found um, was that Leva was superior in terms of symptom improvement, um, and also that Leva reduced the number of incontinence episodes in a day um, from about uh, two episodes every day to one episode every three days. And how long does it usually take to start to see results? Um, many women see results within four weeks. Uh, we offer a 12-week program. Ladies, I want to hear from you. So how was it, Kim? How was your experience? Did it work for you? I began to see results within the first two weeks. It wasn't anything major at first, but I knew something was happening. And it, it was so encouraging. And I said, it gives you visual, real-time feedback. So you know that you're doing the Kegel properly and it's going to be effective. Um, I would say within four weeks, I was throwing the panty liners and pads out the window. I love that <laughs> so much. It's true when you can see that you're working and it's, it's actually working and you're, it's effective. Yes. Incredible. And how about you, Anna? Yeah, I mean, I, I loved it right away just because I was a postpartum mom. So I really thought that I was either gonna have to go to physical therapy or I was going to have to get surgery to worst case scenario. But using the Leva, I had the coach, which we've talked about, the at-home coach that kept me accountable for everything. Um, and when I used it, I just immediately started to see results within a few weeks. And when I, the first time I used it, it was like really low on the barometer, as you'll see on the scale. And I could see how, just how weak my pelvic floor muscles were from having a baby. And it was just a few weeks later that all of a sudden I was stronger. And it was amazing. I stopped leaking full three weeks into treatment. Incredible. So doctor, are there any risks? Um, so the only risks with Leva come with improper use. So proper use involves keeping the Leva clean, um, not sharing Leva, and also working in uh, conjunction with your, with your doctor. So if you found that you were pregnant, you should stop using Leva and reach out to your physician for instructions. I think this is such good news for so many people out there. Doctor, where can we go to get more information? So uh, one thing you can do is approach your physician and ask them if they think you're a good candidate for Leva. Um, also, you can contact our Leva Women's Center, and the educators there can give you more information. And, and more information about how to contact them, um, you can see uh, on our website, which is levatherapy.com. Doctor, ladies, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your stories. I know it's going to make a big difference to a lot of women out there. And for more information on today's discussion, you can always visit our website at accesshealth.tv. See you next time.